Now, after four months of war in Sudan, more than one million people have fled to neighboring states and people are running out of food and dying due to lack of health care. The United Nations agencies uh, said in a joint statement that the situation is spiraling out of control. We have details for you in this intro package. Take a listen. It's been four months since crisis broke out between the Sudanese military and the paramilitary force, and there seems no end in sight for locals, many of whom have fled for safety. According to the United Nations, more than one million people have fled Sudan to neighboring countries like Egypt, Libya, Central African Republic, Chad and South Sudan as the war continues head on. A massive problem of food insecurity in addition to a paucity of medical supplies continues to threaten the lives of the people. Nearly 4,000 people have died since April when the war broke out and the UN has also reported cases of gender-based violence against women in the country. Despite this grim reality, the warring parties have doubled down on fighting and have failed to accommodate any entreaty seeking to end their tussle for control. Sudan remains one of the world's most troubled nations as military leader General Al-Fatah al-Buran and Mohamed Dagalu head in the paramilitary have failed to settle their differences. Now joining me tonight um, on Secure the Continent is al Idris, a public affairs analyst who joins us from Cardiff in Wales and I also have Hamid Kalafala, a researcher and policy analyst who joins us from the Egyptian capital, Cairo. And one welcome to you, gentlemen, and thanks for joining me on the program. Thank you very much for having us. Now I'd like to start with you, Amid. Uh, given the complex and multifaceted nature of the conflict uh, that is into its fourth month, what overarching strategies uh, do you believe are required to effectively address the humanitarian crisis in Sudan and garner stronger international support and response? Because it seems uh, the world's attention is divided between the conflict in Ukraine and, of course, the latest development of the situation in Niger. Uh, Sudan seems to, uh, to be losing its, uh, uh, its place on the news. Absolutely. And I think, you know, before before Sudan started losing its place uh, in the news, uh, the, the attention and the response that it was getting, the, the conflict was getting from, uh, you know, Western countries, uh, regional countries, uh, international institutions and regional institutions as well, was not adequate. And now it's getting less and less. Although, uh, if you look at the reports uh, of the situation, the humanitarian crisis, but also the potential for this to become, uh, you know, a full-on civil war, and it has already gotten to that in specific areas. But you know, there is a threat that this will go on all over the country, but not only in the country, and it will extend to the Horn of Africa and the Sahel region, and with the new developments uh, across the Sahel, uh, that the potential is becoming real. Uh, so the attention it's getting and the response is getting has not been enough. But even the you know, little attention that is getting has unfortunately been very much fragmented, where different actors are doing different things uh, in different platforms, in different places, and in so many cases competing rather, co rather than coordinating their efforts, uh, which is a huge problem because this kind of gives, um, you know, the warring generals a way out uh, to kind of escape uh, uh, and evade these talks and, and, and come up with excuses for why they're joining this initiative and not that one and so on. So what we need now urgently is a coordinated mechanism that brings on board all different stakeholders. Uh, obviously, Sudanese civilians at the heart of it, uh, leading it and, you know, designing it and all of that. But we need the international actors who have leverage over the warring actors to be able to work together uh, so that this war could come to an end. Uh, as you mentioned, this humanitarian situation, you know, does not give us uh, a lot of time to figure out the way forward. Uh, things are getting worse uh, every minute. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Amir. I'd like to bring in al in Cardiff. Now, al could you provide a nuanced analysis of the specific triggers and underlying factors that have led to the rapid deterioration of the situation in Sudan? 
over the course of the past four months. I do understand that several attempts at a ceasefire, uh, at several ceasefires keep breaking down. Well, um, just to further echo on the words of Hamid, in terms of, uh, and your question, in terms of the complexity that we're seeing in Sudan, especially in terms of the humanitarian aid side, we see many examples of both sides and the belligerents um, coming up with new mechanisms. However, it's used to capture um, their own kind of objectives. This is seen with SAHO, the Sudan Agency Relief Humanitarian Operations, uh, created by the Rapid Support Forces, announced by Hemeti as a means for humanitarian organizations mm -hmm. to go into RSF-controlled areas. However, this is turning into a battle of not only with bullets and guns, but turning into aid uh, capture as well, um, as the nation, the state already has the Humanitarian Aid Commission. This further goes on, as we see in terms of the massive inf uh, misinformation and disinformation campaigns. Um, something to report on is that recently Meta, the company that owns Facebook, has yes. recently taken the RSF website, which, uh, or rather the RSF Facebook page, which has over 1.8 million followers, um, even more so, to say that this war has, it's still uh, between RSF and uh, the army is a bit superficial. And to further echo on Hamid's words, that many regional players and actors have made this situation very complicated to the point that there's more chances of this turning into a long-term war or civil war than there are chances for to end it however it still does need to end in terms of negotiations on the tables how due to the uh, amount of violence we're seeing it's not going to be one side that wipes out the other at the end the only they'll have to who, sit and talk it up exactly yeah. but the sudanese people do need a seat on that table as well due to the amounts of crimes against humanities they have faced as well as that uh, has been reported by uh, nimal bagar yesterday on on cnn in terms of the ethnic cleansing that we've seen in darfur uh, and that of the masalit uh, and further reports from the human rights watch in terms of what's going on to the civilians but also how the conduct of these soldiers of these belligerents are uh, not only affecting those immediately around them, but the whole nation as well. Thank you, uh, El Bashir. Now, Amid, uh, talking about the uh, situation on ground, uh, the war is in its fourth month, and uh, there are definitely uh, serious consequences to this. Uh, as at the last count, over 4,000 people have been dead and thousands uh, displaced. And people, uh, experts have said, you know, that is uh, quite... Uh, it's 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 not what it could be that the real situation on ground will be uh, more than that. Now, let's talk about the humanitarian situation on ground. Now, delving into the operational realities, uh, the fighting is, is, is beyond Khartoum at this point in Obdurman. Uh, we've seen waters happening in the full uh, water view. Now, talking about the humanitarian situation, uh, what specific logistical and operational challenges do humanitarian organizations encounter in delivering aid and assistance to the millions of Sudanese affected by the conflict, uh, those humanitarian organizations that uh, still choose to remain in Sudan? Sure. So, if you know, if we speak about challenges in terms of delivering the humanitarian uh, assistance to citizens that need it in, in, in areas uh, where, you know, civilians are caught in the crossfire, there are numerous and so many challenges. However, I think I will, I will you know, answer the other way around. What are the opportunities? Uh, and I think when I speak to that, they, that that's one of the uh, failures, if I may say, uh, of the uh, humanitarian sector, uh, which has become very much, you know, politicized in so many ways, and I will uh, explain why. Uh, so there have been a lot of uh, local initiatives uh, led by Sudanese civilians who are, you know, grassroots groups, uh, civil society groups, uh, who of, of people who are actually caught in this uh, crossfire, but they mm -hmm. have been coordinating efforts and trying to uh, help people around uh, within their communities. And these examples have been very successful uh, despite of, you know, the very limited resources that they have. Uh, and I think this speaks to uh, the, you know, 
African culture, if I may say, of, of community uh, solidarity and how communities uh, come together. However, international organizations uh, in the aid sector have to, you know, a very good extent failed in coordinating with these um, local initiatives and channeling their uh, aids through them because they have been the most successful in reaching those who most need it in the most remote, not remote, but the most uh, difficult areas uh, and so on. Uh, and they have, you know, created a uh, competition between, between, further competition between the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces, uh, as, as, as uh, it was just mentioned by Idris that, you know, uh, SAF had the humanitarian uh, aid commission, which is the official state's uh, quote unquote uh, commission mm -hmm. that is responsible for delivering aid. So the RSF uh, created a part, created a parallel one. So each of them is trying to capitalize uh, on the aid that's coming into the country and use it for, for political reasons to strengthen um, their positions and, and so on. Uh, so instead of supporting uh, locally, uh, led initiatives that have been very successful going through you know these channels has created that competition which means that aid will not reach to those who need it uh a but b it will be very much politicized uh rather than serving uh, the humanitarian uh, purposes uh, that it should so i think you know there's any need for a very urgent uh change in that uh, and for international organizations to be able to kind of remove all the bureaucratic uh obstacles that stops them from working with these local uh, led initiatives. Thank you very much, Amid. Now, Obashu, this conflict is in its fourth month. I want you to tell us what the situation is in Sudan today. Which one of the belligerents has an advantage? Because people uh, would wonder why the Sudanese armed forces uh, will be struggling uh, to have a decisive visit uh, a decisive defeat or victory over the rapid uh, support forces, uh, a militia. And also, could you speak to the point of uh, uh, General Abdel Fattah al uh, the leader of the uh, Sudanese Armed Forces, has addressed to the nation uh, recently uh, highlighting the human rights abuses of the RSF? Uh, did he resonate with the people? What do you make of it? Well, first, in terms of the situation in Sudan today, it's, uh, I'm sure Hamid knows and then anybody else can tell you. In terms of knowing what's happening every single day, there's a lot of rumors. And due to the situation after four months of constant warfare with the whole civilian infrastructure being attacked, uh, internet coverage that relies us to get our information from the outside has been very difficult. However, even after four months and now we've entered the rainy season, which just makes a lot of things much more harder, may it be logistics, operations, may it be communications, it's still we're finding and trying to understand the better picture. Now, in terms of a decisive victory and to your question of why isn't the army essentially winning this, uh, well, that's, that's the question that a lot of Sudanese people have. They were first told within the first few days that they would essentially win this um, very rapid battle. However, it's now uh, escalated or rather spiraled out of control uh, into a civil war. And the people further on uh, have no trust in exactly who's going to win. Um, you're gonna, you have many different sides that keep on shouting and jeering for their side that essentially is going to win. You would think the army would because they would have planes and through air superiority, mm -hmm. it would supposedly win this battle, however, or rather war. However, we have seen a lot of collateral damage, not only from the RSF, but also from the army um, who have indiscriminately attacked civilian homes. Even today, it's just been reported that a Royal Care Hospital in Khartoum has been airstriked, uh, meaning it could only be the army unless uh, RSF have now gained um, significant aerial capabilities. Um, now, on to your question of how... Uh, or, by how speech, yes. Uh, ...about Burhan's speech um, that he's given um, two days ago now, I believe. Um, and rather information today that it has come out that um, the army intends to collect documents uh, and, and seek legal avenues um, with that of the RSF 
uh, last month, uh, there was that talk of the chief prosecutor of the ICC saying that it is possible to perhaps open up or rather continue the case in Darfur due to um, the crimes against humanity and war crimes we're seeing. Um, and to further add on top of that, we're now hearing that the army, which is to take um, the rapid support forces to the ICC, uh, considering how ironic it is that mm -hmm. only in 2009, Omar um, al-Bashir at the time was indicted and wanted by the ICC. However, the Sudanese people, or rather uh, the supporters of al-Bashir during the time, were very much against this idea of a foreign intervention in terms of courts or legal manners or routes. Um, so it's quite different and ironic to see this uh, change of heart and, uh, and mind. Uh, however, if, if both parties do want to go forward, there has to be accountability and justice um, measures and mechanisms. So in terms of what we're looking for in the future, still, we'll say again, um, they will have to sit down and negotiate eventually, uh, even if they continue shooting. It's not going to stop unless this happens. Thank you, Obuchu. Now, Ahmed, let's track back a bit. Uh, could you explain the historical and political context that has fueled uh, the evolution of this current conflict in Sudan, tracing the dynamics from the initial eruption to the present and highlighting key shifts in parties and strategies? Okay, so I think, you know, when, when we speak about the history of this conflict, uh, there, there, there is a lot... Uh, a lot of intertwined uh, realities uh, that have contributed to the eruption of war in Sudan. But I think the main thing that, you know, we need to look at is, you know, that the military uh, or the paramilitary rapid support forces that was created by the former regime of Umar al-Bashir, uh, who was at the time uh, the superior, um, you know, the supreme command of, of, of the commander of the army, uh, commander-in-chief, uh, established the rapid support forces, empowered them, allowed them to grow uh, the way they, that they have grown. But that was continued uh, by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan after the revolution, where he allowed them, you know, uh, to have access to strategic places in, in the capital Khartoum that they have never had, uh, you know, access to. Uh, they continued to grow economically. Uh, and all of that was, you know, with the army watching and seeing. So this is why I think it's important, you know, not only for the army, there is important the army lost its legi its legitimacy when it allowed that and, and and so on and that's why you know there is there is some support or there is okay let, let's say large support to the army uh, from the Sudanese people but there is also a lot of criticism about how this is in so many ways the army's mistake for allowing mm -hmm. the rapid support forces to exist and to expand and to grow in the way that it has grown um, so this is one 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 of the dangers that one of the causes that the issue of the multiplicity of armies was not uh, dealt with the way it should have been dealt with. Uh, in the transitional period uh, between 2019 and 2021, obviously it was a very complex and difficult issue to address, but I think there was some space for civilian, uh, for the civilian government to try to do more in terms of, you know, controlling this issue and, and making sure that it does not escalate in the way that it has escalated. Mm -hmm. After that, I think, you know, regardless of what the intentions were, the political kind of uh, dynamics that were dominating the scene, uh, where the rapid support forces leader was more uh, showing more support to the democratic transition than the Sudanese armed forces, uh, and which made a lot of political parties uh, or, you know, the, a lot of political parties that were within the pro-democracy uh, group kind of, um, I wouldn't say, you know, create an alliance uh, with him, but I think to a good extent they were kind of coordinating with him because he was showing more interest, uh, although obviously these were not his genuine intentions, but he was showing more interest in the democratic transition. And I think that was also obviously a mistake now we can all see. Absolutely. Uh, because, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The army, given the luxury of hindsight, the, uh, the SAF created a monster in the RSF that is finding it very difficult uh, to tame now. Now, Al-Bashir, we've had several ceasefires uh, that have failed 
uh, in the course of this conflict. I mean, some of the ceasefires fail uh, even before the ink it was written and dries. Now, given the history of failed ceasefire agreements in this four-month conflict, what innovative diplomatic approaches and strategies do you believe uh, could contribute to a more lasting and meaningful resolution to the ongoing conflict? Because when people hear another ceasefire now, they're, yeah, they're very skeptical and they're very doubtful that you know, it would hold. Well, the word ceasefire nowadays has another meaning, and the meaning for ceasefire is we can now move our troops and our ammunition and supplies um, with little hindrance. And when the ceasefire supposedly ends, um, then it just continues. But as you've said, of, we've all observed, um, they break it immediately. Um, so in terms of mechanisms that we can look at going forward, um, it's very important to look at the history of our African neighbors as well. Looking into Rwanda, what happened there in the 90s in terms of how they've managed to solve it. Looking into South Africa in terms of the APC uh, and how they've managed to uh, in, come together in terms of unity after uh, decades of uh, freedom fighting and um, statement craft. And there's an opportunity for that here with new players involved. When I say new players, it means the people who aren't pushing this forward, um, expending lives essentially uh, aimlessly, but rather having the ones of the next generations within those um, uh, institutions and militia and different civil society leaders mm -hmm. uh, stepping up to the plate. Um, we've seen the same faces uh, who have been uh, all over the media, all over uh, Sudanese civil and political and even military life. And it's these very same players that continue uh, to push forward their agenda, being backed by regional powers, and uh, that just continues this cycle of mayhem. Now, in terms of uh, this idea, essentially, it's the one that you phase out the old guard, uh, essentially, and then you bring in the new. That's what the um, 2018 uh, revolution tried to do. Um, and it was going according to path until uh, political problems uh, and a coup came in the way. Um, and unfortunately, no manner of a, a large political voice is out there right now that is representing uh, the Sudanese people. So in conclusion, nonetheless, um, Sudan really needs to, the Sudanese government or belligerents need to look into the history of its neighbors in the past who have managed to go through uh, much much dire straits as well, yeah. and they to come out of it um, into a better nation. So let's see where this goes. Thank you, Obershu. Now, Amid, uh, with ethnic violence emerging in certain regions, uh, there are four for one and other places, uh, could you provide an analysis of the interplay between ethnic dynamics and the broader conflict, emphasizing potential challenges and opportunities for conflict resolution? So the rapid support forces were basically created uh, initially from a specific uh, Arab Darfuri tribe, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 that you know that Arab Darfuri tribe or the militia that was created out of it, uh, you know, got involved in in the war in Darfur and had uh, committed a lot of uh, human rights violations uh, against you know, different uh, tribes and groups in, 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 in Darfur, but, you know, more specifically uh, against the African tribes or the non-Arab tribes uh, in Darfur. Uh, so, and, and that kind of ethnic, uh, you know, uh, tension between Arab and non-Arabs uh, in, in Darfur has always been an issue, but with the involvement of the previous regime, the former regime of Omar al-Bashir, and the militias uh, that they recruited and, and so on, that became even more uh, contentious. Now, this war, you know, although started for very political reasons, a power struggle between two uh, two generals and so on, it has gotten in, got into that. And now we have seen areas in, in Darfur where there have been clashes between Arab militias that have kind of sided with the rapid support forces and have been uh, committing uh, atrocities and human rights violations against non-Arab uh, groups. Mm -hmm. So that is the Darfuri kind of dynamic. But then when you move to other areas uh, in Sudan, there are also other ethnic uh, kind of uh, groups. So now the some of the you know supporters of the SAF of the Sudanese Armed Forces have been trying to use 
also ethnic uh, kind of language, hate, hate speech against people of Darfur, suggesting that the rapid support forces represent the people of Darfur. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and that is kind of creating tensions between the people of the, from Darfur and other pe people from other regions uh, in the country. So, you know, the, wherever you go, there is space for its ethnic uh, tensions uh, across the country because it's a very... Uh, and it's, know, not, it's not helping the situation on ground. It is not, and the way the both both warring factions are trying to use the ethnic dynamics is not helpful at all, and in 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 so many ways not responsible, uh, because this will you know become bigger than both of them if they allow this uh, to continue, and the narratives that they are trying to feed uh, uh, to divide the Sudanese people and and so on, it it will definitely become bigger than them, bigger than any political process, and this is why the end, war needs to end now before it, we get into that. Absolutely. Now, uh, Al Bashir, you did mention the irony or the paradox of uh, General Berhan seeking uh, the ICC intervention in the ongoing conflict. Now, considering uh, the investigation by the International Criminal Court, could you elaborate on the potential influence of this international legal process on shaping the trajectory of the conflict and maybe its eventual resolution? Well, uh, first I'd like to say that I'm not a lawyer uh, a person within the legal sense. However, mm -hmm. um, as many Sudanese and many other people right now who are uh, observing the situation in Sudan, um, trying to seek other avenues, um, including legal ones, is on the table. And so the ICC, I'm sure, is definitely looking at a lot of the videos and a lot of the evidence being put online uh, and is being sent to them that shows exactly uh, what, ne what, what what nobody needs to see, uh, and that is genocide, crimes against humanity. Uh, we're seeing rape. Uh, we're hearing their stories as well, uh, and their pieces written online. Um, and the tough part is is that in terms of shaping where things want to go, yes, mm -hmm. uh, African sovereignty. Uh, yes, we're for. Um, you know, to having control of our own nation. But when again and again and again, the leaders of Sudan have failed in showing justice and accountability and transparency, what it really sets out is that to the civilians and citizens is that we cannot trust in our state to deliver us this justice that we've wanted after, during the 2019 revolution and afterwards the subsequent transitional government um, aimed to send Omar Bashir to the ICC and members uh, or rather official members were, were going on a very long uh, cat's tail about how they were going to do so and not do so and then do the court in Sudan and not in Sudan. And so the, the question is, in terms of the ICC's trajectory uh, for the country, is that people are going to have to ask themselves the subsequent transitional government um, aim to send Omar Bashir to the ICC and members uh, or rather official members were, were going on a very long uh, cat's tail about how they were going to do so and not do so and then do the court in Sudan and not in Sudan. And so the, the question is, in terms of the ICC's trajectory uh, for the country, is that people are going to have to ask themselves, how are we going to see this justice uh, mm. come? How is it that we can't do it ourselves. Does that mean we're going, are going to have to resort to an outside kind of uh, international court? Uh, and does that show that we as a society um, cannot hold justice and accountability into our standards? Uh, and, I, and I think that's um, rude. Uh, and, and I think it's possible, uh, especially from um, from a national or even a regional in initiative, but let's be honest, when it comes into the region, unfortunately, we, we have many uh, other military generals and dictators around um, who wouldn't very much like the idea of an international criminal court um, coming to play ball in their home court. Um, so in this instance, w w the Sudanese, we're, we're going to have to do a, a bit of soul searching here on how we're going to get this, um, how it's going to be enforced. Uh, and what goes on from that point on, because we've been given this chance many a time before. Um, this could have been stopped and this, you know, it could have went differently. However, time and time and time again, just like the ceasefires, promises and trust has been broken. Uh, and it's very hard and difficult to rebuild it back. Thank you. Uh...
El Bashir, it's a fine place to go to break. Uh, thank you for your contribution, gentlemen. We will return shortly. Uh, if you're just joining, this is Secure the Continent, a new central television. Uh, the Sudanese conflict uh, between the rapid support forces and the Sudanese armed forces is in its fourth month. Uh, we're looking at prospects for peace and uh, returning uh, Sudan to normalcy. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Secure the Continent and New Central Television. Thank you for staying with us. If you're just joining, uh, we've been looking at the situation in the Sudan conflict and, of course, uh, highlighting the humanitarian concerns. And I still have with me El Bashir Idris, public affairs analyst, joins us live from Cardiff and Wales, and also Hamid Kalafala, a researcher and policy analyst, joining live from the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for staying with us. Now I'd like to uh, begin this half with Amid. Expanding on the urban battlefield scenario in Khartoum, which we've witnessed, uh, what are the far-reaching repercussions of such a transformation in the urban infrastructure, public services, and the overall well-being of the city inhabitants? Uh, you were in Sudan before the conflict broke out. What are the feelings you're getting, and uh, what do you make of this? Unfortunately, all of Sudan's, well, like the vast majority of Sudan's development was concentrated in the capital, Khartoum, uh, and that includes uh, public uh, health uh, or healthcare uh, facilities uh, and all other sorts of, uh, of facilities. So when you know, the, all, all these uh, services facilities in Khartoum uh, were, you know, uh, damaged uh, during the war or became inaccessible because of the security situation and so on. That meant that all other regions have, you know, been uh, dramatically affected by this. Uh, factories uh, in, in, in Khartoum, uh, where also most of the manufacture is centered, uh, have stopped uh, operating. So this has also contributed to the feud uh, security crisis that the country is experiencing. Uh, so the infrastructure of Khartoum is very much central to the whole uh, nation, uh, all, over, all over the country. And even um, safe regions now are experiencing shortages in, in goods, in services, and, and so on, because of uh, the war in Khartoum. Obviously, the war is also taking place in other regions uh, like Darfur uh, and, and, and Kurdufan and so on. Uh, but, you know, Khartoum is central because of this uh, centralization uh, on concentration of services and, and, and uh, development uh, facilities and so on. Uh, so when, you know, you, you go to other places in Khartoum, that uh, other places outside of Khartoum, even that, the ones that are very safe, in terms of security, they have no been, uh, there haven't been any fighting uh, ongoing. Uh, the situation is still very difficult, uh, and and this is kind of it does not get mentioned or does not get uh, reported enough uh, in the media, whether in Sudan or outside Sudan, uh, how the war uh, and the collateral damage that is happening even in safe and secure areas uh, that have now resorted to, for instance, importing goods uh, from Ethiopia, from Egypt, mm. because uh, everything that was coming from Khartoum has stopped. Uh, and of course, it comes at much higher uh, prices when the economic situation is already you know, very dire and getting uh, worse uh, every day because of the conflict. Thank you very much, Amid. Now, El Bashir, exploring, let's look at the uh, cross-border ramifications of this uh, conflict. Uh, what ripple effects has the displacement of over 2.15 million people from Khartoum State had on neighboring regions and uh, countries and how have uh, these nations or regions uh, within Sudan responded to the influx of this internally displaced persons and refugees? Uh, well, just a, a quick point here. So it's um, gone up to 3.4 million uh, in terms of ov overall displaced. And Th thank you very much for that. Yes. No problem. Uh, in the space of four months. And that's a million uh, who have managed to cross over the borders in four months. There's over 680,000 IDP households to try and cover just alone in the Khartoum state going into uh, Al Jazeera uh, uh, state, uh, River Nile state, uh, White Nile state, uh, and so on. Um, those, uh, the, 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 the very 
hold of the city, the very population of the city is, though it's supposed to be uh, in its, what, 5 million um, the, the, or 4 million, they say it goes up to uh, 10, million, uh, 10 million or 11 million. So that spillover, essentially, of all of that mass inflow, uh, influx of IDPs towards uh, states in Sudan, uh, and to the other regions has definitely put a lot of pressure on. To the point, um, the UAE um, supposedly alleges that they have sent a field hospital um, to Chad, bordering that mm -hmm. with Sudan, to apparently deal with the civilians who have uh, escaped from the violence there. However, other reports have come out that this field hospital, for example, may be actually tending to the wounded uh, militia fighters. Um, so even then, uh, towards the neighboring states and how they've been uh, responding to this amidst their own troubles as well in Ethiopia, they've been having problems in mm -hmm. Gonda um, across the border. So sometimes that cuts um, uh, migration for the civilians to exit the country. In terms of even moving around within the nation itself now, um, due to, as, as Ahmed said, as Hamid said, um, hello? Yes, we're with you. Go ahead, please. I, I can Thank hear you, you loud and uh, clear. Thank you. So even as with Port Sudan, uh, or rather, sorry, Hamid saying that Khartoum is the centralization in terms of the resources of state, and now that's over, Port Sudan has been a very important resource linchpin mm -hmm. uh, for the eastern side of the country. How uh, video reports and, and evidence has come up that even this city that has a port and brings its supplies directly is facing gas shortages. So if that's the if this is happening in the best part of the country, then we can only imagine and just see what's happening in the other parts of the country where logistically getting these resources over there is becoming very tiresome, very difficult and very expensive um, for some organizations and local initiatives to do. So in terms of the migration part, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I generally don't know because it's going to hold uh, big strain and pressures onto neighboring countries, which mm -hmm. already have their own problems. And now they're going to have to deal with a large influx of S Sudan migrants uh, as well. Even on further on top of that, uh, it's been reported that 17 Egyptian bus drivers have died in the past two weeks alone driving from Egypt into Sudan due to the intense heat. So even those mm. who are trying to enter to to bring critical uh, and, and life support care, they're unfortunately also facing um, the fallbacks of having a state under war which cannot provide uh, good health care, not only to its citizens, but to the humanitarians who want to come into the country. So, and this could be a reason why, one of many reasons why Sudan is falling out of media coverage, unfortunately, and mm. it's that how does the international community um, go forward? How does the international community address these challenges? And Hamid earlier mentioned these points in terms of um, supporting Sudanese uh, grassroots local-led initiatives, mm -hmm. may it be in Sudan or may, may it be bordering around uh, the country of Sudan, as I'm sure there's a lot of shelter initiatives um, going around and these initiatives do need that support and funding and help. But unfortunately, um, due to the information space, uh, there is a lot of scattering of uh, knowing these organizations and civil led initiative groups because, um, and a uh, lack of mapping, uh, because of these communication problems uh, that we're seeing. But it's, it's good that we have at least a few uh, algorithms and matrix, uh, matrices that can give us just a bit of a picture um, of how it's going. For example, the IOM um, displacement, uh, displacement mm -hmm. tracking matrix, uh, which has been very consistent in its reports on the migration issue of Sudan during the, uh, the past four months. Thank you very much, Earl Bashir. Now, uh, the, a very dire situation uh, El Bashir painted there. Now, Amid, let's track back a bit. Uh, four months ago, the world woke up to news of this uh, former allies uh, going against uh, each other, the belligerents, uh, uh, El Burhan and Hemeti. Now, could you kindly dissect the roles, motivations, and strategic objectives of these key figures, uh, such as uh, Abdel Fattah El Burhan and Mohammed Hamdan Daglo Hemeti, 
And uh, can you provide some insights into how their factions have contributed to the complex dynamics of this conflict? So the fraction between them uh, was, was in so many ways inevitable. This war could have been prevented, I would suggest, but the fraction between both of them was inevitable. They, there was no way that both uh, generals would be able to continue working together because both of them had, you know, very strong political ambitions. Uh, and this is honestly what's, you know, driving this war uh, in addition to uh, so many other reasons. Uh, so for, uh, let's start with General Himeti, uh, the leader of the Rapid Support Forces. This is not, you know, uh, this ambition is not uh, is not here by chance or by coincidence. This has always been his strategic project, uh, mm. and uh, to to use his uh, militia uh, that he has created uh, with support of Amir al-Bashir and then with support of Abdel Fattah al-Burhan himself uh, to build an economic empire, which he has very successfully built now, uh, and 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 has his has you know endless uh, economic resources uh, that we could say no one knows exactly how big his economic empire is uh, and so on. So he's done that. And then the next step was his political uh, kind of ambitions uh, and so on. He was, I think, in my opinion, planning to come through a political process, uh, through elections or something or in some way or another. Uh, but then the war became a reality. And now this is his path. Uh, to, to, to ruling uh, the country. On the other hand, uh, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, I don't think he had this, you know, huge political ambition in the beginning, but ever since he became the uh, head of the Sovereign Council after the revolution in 2019, he has shown signs of uh, growing political interest. Uh, now, after, you know, getting involved in so many... Uh, crimes uh, against humanity against protesters uh, mm -hmm. uh during during the um before during the revolution but now during the war as well uh and so on i think it's not only for him um the the human the political ambition as well but also to save himself uh from prosecution obviously same applies to uh the leader of the rapid support forces uh Himeti, but i think his political ambition is stronger but for for and for him for abdel fatah al burhan now it's it's more of a way that you know he needs to save uh, himself uh, from from prosecution, but I think for both figures, it's now uh, you know a life or death kind of uh, game. Uh, so they they won't be able to retreat easily. But for the rapid support forces as an institution, uh, mm -hmm. if we may call it an institution, uh, it's a it's a life or death matter for the whole uh, thing, uh, not only for the leader. So this is why they will continue to fight. Uh, and and you know until they have no other uh, they have no other option. Thank you very much. Quite poignant point uh, there, Amid. Now, uh, El Bashir, as we begin to wind down on the conversation, I'll let you have the final say. And this is the million dollar question: What comprehensive approach would you recommend to holistically address the humanitarian crisis, including strategies for famine prevention and protection? Uh, most importantly, uh, the vulnerable populations and sustainable aid delivery. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something maybe the generals could learn, and that is splitting this question, uh, which I wish to split with Hamid. Uh, hopefully we can get a half a million each. Now, in terms of the way that this uh, should go in terms of the strategies moving forward, it does need to be very mapped or really mapped well on the many different violations that have happened, not only in Khartoum and uh, Darfur, in Kurdafan, uh, but violations that have happened not only between belligerents, but belligerents and citizens and civilians. These also needs to be mapped, recorded, noted and jotted down and even archived for until after this war. Um, other in terms of uh, problems is that of the aid part and the humanitarian uh, emergency aspect. Um, it does need to be explored on what type of uh, emergency uh, response is needed. Uh, well, I'm 
going to say it has to be a very big, frantic, um, super strong, powerful kind of response. As I've said, in the past four months, we've had uh, astronomical, astronomical kind of figures uh, that have happened. Uh, and I'm sure if you were to look at that uh, or this situation now compared to other uh, humanitarian situations of this modern era and previous, you would see that Sudan really does rank up there, possibly number one, top two. In terms of the security aspect, well, I'm 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 not a soldier, so I'm not going to uh, fully say mm-hmm. on how they should do things. But um, whatever it is, and and to further uh, elaborate uh, on on the ex- existential uh, crisis they're having, uh, especially between the two leaders and the leaderships okay. of two institutions, um, in, in, it definitely requires a sort of um changing because the very same fighters we're seeing in in, in terms of the rsf are the children uh, and some of them even the old fighters of the okay. jujuid that have the genocide in darfur so whatever's moving forward um we just have to make sure we immediately nip this culture and society that uh pushes forward for such uh savage acts of barbarism against uh, normal civilians and uh, uh, and even, tr- uh, I, I won't say tribalism, but uh, in terms of the mm. ethnic kind of uh, targeting that we've been seeing, um, it, it, whatever is that's allowed us um, to get to that point, whatever kind of okay. uh, society and values, uh, these also needs to be checked. I can't answer that question fully. <laughs> Thank you, Obishu. Let me try and let Hamid uh, Kalafala have a final bite at the cherry, if you can, in less than 60 seconds. I would appreciate what are the most important steps that need to be taken to bring this conflict to an end? So I think the separation of the issue of humanitarian uh, uh, situation and security arrangements from the political process and suggesting that we should deal with humanitarian and security arrangements uh, like what was happening in Jeddah in the Jeddah platform and then we move into the political process mm. and so on is, is not useful. The humanitarian uh, situation and the security arrangements are very much political issues. So we need a holistic political process that addresses everything together, uh, obviously in an in a sequenced ma- uh, manner. But everything must needs to be addressed together. Okay. The other Thank you. Th- that we... Yes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm afraid we've uh, run out of time. El Bashir, Idris, and Ahmed Kalafala, I do appreciate your insights and contribution uh, to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.